What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts. On today's episode, I wanted to answer some of the most common questions I get about animal-based diets and the way I think about which foods are more toxic and less toxic and which oils are preferred. Specifically, the common questions I get here are, what about mushrooms? What about olive oil? What about coconut oil? And what about avocado oil? So let's start with mushrooms. When we are thinking about mushrooms and plants, so fungus and plants, and animals, we have to think about the position that these organisms, these life forms occupy within an ecosystem. Animals can run away from you. They have built-in defense mechanisms, teeth, horns, hooves, legs to move around. Plants don't have this. So evolutionarily, plants developed spines, hard shells, thorns, but also defense chemicals. Fungi are also generally sessile. They're generally stuck in the ground. Some fungus move a little bit. There's like slime molds that move a little bit, but generally fungi are stuck in the ground. Mushrooms are stuck in the ground generally, or they're growing on trees, different types of fungi. So just like plants, fungi have had to develop defense mechanisms because they are an organism that is in the ground or on trees. They are generally non-motile. So some fungi encase their whole body in very hard shells. If you've ever seen a reishi mushroom, it's like almost like wood. It has a very, very hard shell. It's not very easy for an animal to go and bite it, although some might. In the cell wall of fungi, it's something called chitin, which is a pretty difficult to digest substance that protects fungi, but we can denature it by boiling them. But a lot of times if you eat a mushroom and it has chitin in the cell wall, which most fungi do, they're not gonna, you're not gonna digest much of it because that cell wall is a very good defense mechanism. And if you know anything about mycology or the kingdom of fungi, you'll know there are many, many very, very poisonous mushrooms. I've often said, I think this is something I got from Steve Rinella when I was in Montana on his podcast. If you think about animals, a very, very small fraction of animals are poisonous for you. Maybe a puffer fish, a liver of a random thing, a, a one small toad in the Amazon, but the majority of animals, 99% of animals are edible and not toxic. 99% of the parts of animals are edible and not toxic. Animals don't have defense chemicals. Only 20 to 30% of plants are actually toxic, meaning they won't kill you or lead to massive GI distress, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea immediately when you eat them. The same is true about fungi. A very small proportion of the kingdom of fungi are actually edible. Most of them are quite toxic. You wouldn't wanna go around sampling mushrooms in the forest. I'm sure many of our ancestors died doing that or had massively bad reactions or hallucinated depending on the mushroom that they might have been eating from cow poop if it was a uh, psilocyte. So mushrooms contain defense chemicals. This is undeniable. And the question we must ask ourselves is the ones that we choose to eat, are there benefits that outweigh the defense chemicals? Do they have unique benefits that we can't get other places? I generally feel that the answer to this question from everything I've seen is no. This isn't to say that there aren't chemicals that have been isolated from some mushrooms that have shown benefit in certain studies, but there's also chemicals that have been isolated from some plants that show benefits in certain studies. And what I've repeatedly asked people to think about with regard to plant chemicals and also now with regard to fungal chemicals is, do they have a unique benefit and do the benefits outweigh the risks? Meaning if you're eating a diet of meat and organs, meaning you're a good hunter, right? And not a crappy hunter. You have meat and organs in your diet. You have animal fat and you have availability of less toxic plant foods, which I think of as generally as fruit. These are the types, the parts of the plant that plants want you to eat to move the seeds around in your poop, but not always eat the seeds, which is why many times the seeds are numerous or encased in shells, etc. When you have access to those foods and honey, why would you go looking for foods that are lower down in the hierarchy? That's one of the things I've tried to do with my work is create this hierarchy of plant toxicity, this hierarchy of plant value within human life. And I would put fruit and honey, honey's not really a plant food, it's more of an animal food, at the top of that. And moving down into the vegetables and the seeds much lower and fungi on the lower part of it, which is why if you look at the animal-based diet continuum, the infographic, which you can get by emailing us radicalhealth at heartandsoil.co, uh, and if you guys are interested, we're doing an animal-based 30 next month. So we do these every quarter 
You can email us if you want details, but we're going to do an organized Animal Base 30 challenge in the month of August, so stay tuned for that. But in the infographic that I built for an animal based diet, you'll see that fungi are generally not regarded as less toxic. They're medium to highly toxic. I think you should just generally avoid them. But they're all in vogue now because chemicals are making mushroom teas, which are claimed to be better than coffee. Well, nobody thinks, I don't really, all of you know that I'm not a huge fan of coffee in the first place. So is mushroom tea better? I don't think so. I'm not convinced that these mushrooms contain compounds that are uniquely beneficial for healthy humans that are already eating meat and organs and the least toxic plant foods. And there are a lot of question marks that remain around could some of the chemicals found in these plants also be harming us. Consider the example of many of the other plant compounds that I've talked about in the past, like curcumin, for instance. Yeah, there are some studies showing that it may have an anti-inflammatory effect, but there are other studies that are often ignored showing that that same chemical in plants has negative effects elsewhere in the body. And so the question with regard to curcumin is why are you not fixing the underlying root cause of your inflammation and can you really say that that chemical in plants is beneficial, that the risks outweigh the benefits? They may for some people, or the benefits outweigh the risks, the risks, excuse me. But generally for most of us that are healthy and are eating meat and organs, that isn't a benefit for us. That's just a negative, uh, that chemical. So the downsides of turmeric, I've talked about multiple times in the past, it affects potassium channels, it affects thyroid oxygen reductase, it can affect the P53 gene. It's been shown to be toxic in some cell cultures. So there's a lot of potential downsides to these plant chemicals. These are what I've called the collaterally damaging side effects, the package insert of plant chemicals. When you go to the pharmacy, you get a pharmaceutical, all the pharmaceuticals come with package inserts, which say, these are the side effects of this drug. Why do we accept plant? Why do we expect plant molecules to be any different than this? Why do we expect fungal molecules to be any different than this? I'm not debating that there are some fungal molecules that may have a benefit in isolated study. What I am questioning is whether we can really confidently say that these fungal molecules are beneficial in otherwise healthy humans and don't have other negative effects that aren't being accounted for. So I'm sort of making this determination from first principles and I'm thinking those fungi are rooted in the ground. They have to have defense chemicals. There's nothing in there I don't that I'm not getting other places or that is really gonna have a unique effect on my body that I've seen in the research. I'm not convinced of that. And I'm convinced or I'm concerned that there may be things that may be harming us that we're not accounting for. So generally my opinion on mushrooms is pass. If you're starving in the wilderness, would you pick an edible mushroom and eat it? Probably. Is it something you should make a part of your diet in a big proportion? I'm not convinced it's going to have unique benefits. If you absolutely freaking love mushrooms, should, can you eat them? Great. Go ahead. That's not a problem. But if you have issues, if you have autoimmune issues, for instance, don't ignore the fact they might be triggering this. Anecdotally, I will add that I think one of my worst eczema flares in my life was triggered by large doses of reishi, chaga, and lion's mane that I got in a powder. And there is some precedent for this if you look at the literature. There are certainly cases of uh, oxalate nephropathy from chaga in the literature, which I have talked about in my book, The Carnivore Code, and elsewhere. So chaga-induced oxalate mushroom nephropathy. This was a woman who was 72 years old. She already had cancer, um, and she was taking quite a bit of chaga, four to five teaspoons a day, but then she ended up with uh, diffuse tubular atrophy, interstitial fibrosis of the kidneys, oxalate crystals in the kidneys, not a good thing. And there's a concern that some of the oxalates in this chaga may be insoluble or perhaps accumulate more in the kidney um, than soluble oxalates. So there's a lot of questions here. Not a fan of chaga, not a fan of reishi, not a fan of lion's mane. Um, again, I didn't isolate which one of those might have caused my eczema flare, but anecdotally, they seem to be an association. Not the perfect scientific experiment, just sharing my experiences. So ask that question with fungi. Are you really getting anything super valuable that you're missing other places or that's gonna have a unique role in humans uh, physiologically? I'm not convinced and I haven't seen it in the science. It's not to say that you can't isolate the compounds, give it to a sick population and see a benefit, but if you're already healthy, if you're already eating meat and organs and the least toxic plant foods or desiccated organs like we make it hard in soil, if you need more of those, you can always check us out, hardandsoil.com, .co, excuse me, hardandsoil.co. If you're already doing those things, can we really say that mushrooms are beneficial? I'm not convinced. Okay, that's the view on mushrooms. I'll give them a pass. What about olive oil? If you wanna press your own olives and make perfect olive oil and use it when it's fresh and not rancid, great. But olive oil is a very high proportion of oleic acid. It's very highly monounsaturated. Uh, Proportion-wise, there's a higher proportion of linoleic acid, 10 to 14% in olive oils. So there's more on saturation in olive oils uh, than I generally like to see, and they can become rancid over time, and they are often cut with other oils. There is a large proportion 
of oils, olive oil that is tainted, that is cut with seed oils. There's tons of docu documentation of that. This article is 2012 in the New Yorker, Olive Oil's Dark Side. There's a ton of corruption in the olive oil industry um, from Forbes. The olive oil scam, if 80% is fake, why do you keep buying it? Good question. Uh, I know there's a lot of oil that's fake and rancid out there. Here's a study from UC Davis showing that olive oil, some consumers actually like it rancid, um, yeah, I don't want rancid olive oil. And how do you know the olive oil you're eating is not rancid? Are you doing the peroxide test to look for like the peroxides in that oil? And I've heard recently through the grapevine, through some friends that many purveyors of boutique olive oils, I won't name names here, but you guys might know people in the health space who claim you should use vegetables as a delivery method for olive oil, were caught selling really rancid, really crappy quality olive oil. No surprise. It's not very robust in terms of longevity. Imagine that. So I'm not a huge fan of olive oil. Uh, I think animal fat is much more stable and has more nutrients in it than I want. So I always tell people, why are you eating olive oil? Why don't you just eat tallow? Um, why don't you just eat suet? Why don't you just eat animal fat from well-raised animals? Now be careful with pork fat. If the pig is fed lots of corn and soy, as I talked about on my podcast previously, that's going to change the amount of linoleic acid in the fat of the pig. I'm not a fan of pork fat. Generally speaking, I'm a fan of ruminant animal fat, which would be goat fat, deer fat, bison fat, cow fat. That's like what we put in our fire starter supplement at Hardened Soil, it's suet. So it's a kidney fat, which is super high in stearic acid, a compound I've talked about in the past, put in a capsule to make it easy for you guys. So I'm a fan of animal fat over plant fat. So olive oil, if you can press it yourself, if you are sure that, that olive oil is not cut with seed oils, if you are sure that, that olive oil is not rancid, and you want to put it on something and tallow is not going to pour at room temperature, great. But so many of the uses when I ask people of olive oil, you could use tallow for that and it can be so much better. The same is true of avocado oil. In fact, there's probably even more corruption in the olive oil, in this, in, excuse me, in the avocado oil industry. Um, this study from UC Davis as well. Study finds 82% of avocado oils are rancid or mixed with other oils. How do you know that all of the avocado oil that your chips are fried in, I mean, even boiling the oil to fry your chips in is going to make it partially rancid and damage the oil. And how do you know it's not cut with other oils? This is the problem with these oils, guys. Why are we saying that avocado oil is great? Why not just use tallow? Why not just use animal fat? There's no answer. <laughs> use animal fat instead. So I'm not a huge fan of olive oil or avocado oil unless you pressed it yourself. If you want to eat fresh avocados or fresh olives, I think those are great but think about the amount of olive oil you could accumulate and how many olives you'd have to press to get that amount of olive oil. Both of these oils are also higher in linoleic acid, significantly higher in linoleic acid than ruminant animal fat. The latter ruminant animal fat is about 2% linoleic acid. These oils are 10 to 14% linoleic acid. And I continue to have concerns that evolutionarily inconsistent levels of linoleic acid could cause metabolic harm for humans. It's something we're still trying to flesh out. I've done lots of podcasts on this if you wanna go back in detail and look at that. So olive oil, avocado oil, unless you are absolutely sure of the quality and you know it's fresh, just use animal fat. Why wouldn't you? Coconut oil is much more stable. Coconut oil, 2% linoleic acid, almost entirely saturated. It's great, use coconut oil, but anything you're using coconut oil for, why wouldn't you just use tallow for that? Use animal fat. It's going to have fat soluble vitamins from the animals. It's going to have unique things like stearic acid, this, um, this uh, 18 carbon saturated fatty acid that I'm fascinated by that has been shown to activate mitochondria and turn on fat burning in studies. Again, this is all in the past, guys. It's all in my podcast. You can look for the stearic acid studies uh, and the podcast I've done the stearic acid in the past, but it's really only found in significant quantities in animal fat. And you're gonna also miss odd chain fatty acids, things I haven't really talked about a ton, but you can, I can talk about more in the future, pentadecanoic acid, heptadecanoic acid, and odd chain fatty acids found in animal fat uniquely have unique biological roles, healthy roles in humans. Imagine that, animal fat uniquely beneficial for humans. This is why I was so excited about our fire starter supplement at Hardened Soil when it came out, because humans do better with more stearic acid in their diet. And listen to the podcast I've done with, um, many people about stearic acid in the past as well. So in summary, mushrooms, I give it a pass. Olive oil, generally give it a pass. Avocado oil, generally give it a pass. Coconut oil, maybe, but why not just use tallow? So hopefully that helps. I'm gonna go grill some steaks with my crew from Heart and Soil. Love you all, stay radical. Check us out at heartandsoil.co. We've got her package coming out in a couple of weeks. You can sign up 
to be the first to be notified about that. Whole package is already out. I'm super stoked about that one. The most testicle of any supplement on the market, plus blood and liver. And you can guess what it's good for. It's good for sexual performance. I love it. All right, guys. Talk to you soon. Stay radical.